Mitchell and Ryan in the front row. <laughs> Anthony's the only intelligent one. You see where he's sitting? <laughs> yeah. Don't make y'all nervous. I'm getting a little too close to, to, to people that aren't used to me being in their face. <laughs> well, don't worry, I'll get down there. <laughs> Will you pray with me and for me, please? Father, we thank you uh, just for this gift. The gift of your son. The gift to him coming, becoming like God, so flesh and bone so that we could be like you, clothed in righteousness. In just the same way as we have clothed the East End in righteousness today, clothe ourselves, dear Lord. Help us to remember our baptisms. And help us to be thankful. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be true and pleasing and only from you, dear Lord. Amen. So, what do you fear the most? that deep fear? I have deep fear that Game of Thrones is really never going to come back again, right? <laughs> no. Deep fear that the mullet's coming back. Now that's something to fear, right? <laughs> you have a rocket mullet? I think so. Okay. Well, we're, we're good. Most of us would say death, right? You fear that? I would say as a Christian, I'm not fearful of death. My children think that I just kind of embrace it, like whenever, come on, Lord. But I am a little fearful of how that death happens, right? Because I'm really sorry to break it to everyone here. You're all going to die. Now this sounds like a really fun sermon, right? None of us are escaping death. And yet, we don't care to talk about it too much, right? We're like, hey, let's get around the table and we'll talk about that today, right? We'll have some turkey, some chicken, and then we'll talk about that. No. We try to keep death at an arm's length away from us. We use words, right, to soften it, like you pass on, slip away, depart, <coughs> go on an airplane, Joanne. We die. We really don't want to look that in the face because Many of us do not know what the next step is. We keep death at a distance because it's a reality we really don't want to think about, isn't it? Now, in our country, not too many years ago, death was treated in a much different manner. If somebody died in your family, your family took care of it, right? They died in a family. The loved one would come. And they would prepare the body. And they would wash the body. And they would clothe the body. And then the body would be lying in state in your home. Sometimes, it would make the casket. And so we think about that in a grieving process. How much more beautiful that is, rather than putting death behind us, right? Or just sending death away, and I'm not being disingenuous. That's our society today. I'm just telling you how I see how we view death. After the Civil War, it got a little different. After the Civil War, Americans had never seen death in this mass amount. Death was an everyday horror. Some men were 
buried at their floor right where they fell, where they weren't buried at all. But those who had some means, there was this new enterprise called the Undertaker. A way to preserve that body so it could be shipped home. <coughs> so the family could bury their loved ones, right? And now, we prefer to let the undertaker take care of it, right? To distance ourselves because death is fearful. Death can be fearful and it can be the unknown thing. And so at every funeral, we kind of think in our mind, we say like Job, if a man dies, if a person dies, can they live again? Christians would say what? Yes. Absolutely, right? It's a tenet of our faith. Jesus Christ is a perfecter of our faith, the firstborn. We said it when we said the Apostles' Creed, what we believe in. And some said it, but they're not really sure they believe in it. My hope is that you would take those words and live them, read them, let them wash over you. I believe. There's God created. I believe that this God. Do you hear my stomach growling? I said, sure yeah, not really. <laughs> that this God, <laughs> incarnation, came down as one of us. Because we were not capable of obtaining our own righteousness. We're incapable of defeating sin, of keeping sin out of our lives. We believe that this Christ lived a life, perfect life, in perfection because we couldn't. In perfection in our place. To save us from the power of sin, capital S, and death. Christ took all the ugliness of humanity up on that cross to put it to death. So that, by believing in him and this that he has done, you shall have eternal life too. Resurrection of the body. The penultimate phrase in the Apostles' Creed. The second to last. Saying what we believe, right? The resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Now, how are we to understand this resurrection of the body? I think we need to understand a few things. One, we have a love-hate relationship with our body, yes? This is God's perfection right here. We're just not seeing the glorified form, right? Our bodies are designed to disintegrate. During this sermon, you are getting older. And you're going to get much older. If it's a long sermon, Easton is like a brand new car. And he just got pulled off the lot. And as soon as that brand new car pulls out of the lot, what's happening? It's decreasing. It's decreasing. Yeah. It's losing value, right? Now, that car might run pretty well for a long time. I mean, Beeston's got a Toyota, but Toyota body. He's in pretty good shape, right? But, 
Some of us got Chevy bodies. You have a Ford. A Chevy body, I'm sorry. You have a Ford body like me, you are the most to be pitied. <laughs> Fix for repair date. And as we get older, we can see how that comes true, right? You have less original parts. Off-market parts, right? We are designed to get old. We can buy whatever you want. You can buy as much moisturizer and, and uh, products. And you can disguise aging, but you can't stop it. And sometimes these bodies, they do pretty good, right? Back those rows right there, you got three of them right together. Vintage mix. <laughs> I would call them good lopping, but I can't say that in front of them, right? Ninety years. You expect to have a car until the run for ninety years? No. Right? You expect your body will never wear out? Just look at your dad. That's what you got to look forward to. <laughs> right? We know when we're getting older. Knees buckle and the belt won't. I got more hair growing out of my ears than I do out of my head, right? <laughs> okay. You start to multitask. When you want to tie your shoe, you're like, oh, I've gone over this newspaper I brought the other day. And get down and tie it. We are all destined to die. Death is a part of life, right? And so here Christ comes, right? Because death is the enemy. Christ comes to offer us victory over death. We're still going to die. Well, how can that be victory? Does that make sense? No. But we're in the process of salvation, of being saved. Jesus came and defeated death on the cross Vindicated on the third day when that tomb was empty. And he appeared to a lot of people in his resurrected body. There's going to come a time when death is no more. You believe that? We live in this tension. Where we still die. And yet, the perfecter of our faith says that we will be like him. Life everlasting. No separation from God. Death is the final enemy to be defeated. And we live in the tension between those two. Christ has defeated, and Christ is coming again, second advent, to make this final. And so our redemption as Christians, even though when we die, is not complete when we die. We ought to say, death is a natural part of life. No, it's not. It's unnatural. Death is a separation of the soul and the body. They're separated. Adam and Eve weren't supposed to die. There was never supposed to be that separation. So what happens when we die? 
Paul would say to be absent from the body is to be what? <coughs> Present with Christ. Ecclesiastes. Dust to dust. The body goes to dust. The spirit returns to God who gave it to you. Amen? And so, this is where we might have a little bit wrong as Christians. We think heaven is that final destination. We're separated from our bodies. You're raising a Baptist. <laughs> We're present with God. Our loved ones are present with God. But that's not the final story. We often comfort ourselves, like, oh, Eddie's up there fishing with Jesus. Right? Or he's on that big tree stand in the sky. <laughs> That's not the full gospel. Our full redemption is when we have a restored, resurrected body. Our soul and our body are coming back together again. And that only happens at the second coming. And Jesus promised this. He's like, well, Jesus is sure taking a good old sweet time, isn't he? Until the full of his time, Jesus doesn't even know when it's coming. Only the Father knows. So we die, we're present with Christ, but we're separated by our bodies. When Christ comes again, our bodies and our spirit are reunited in the new heaven and the new earth. said how Paul said the seed has to die. It has to get planted. A seed you can't tell the seed is a tomato seed. Can you? Not me either. Carol Zimmerman, she can. Watch out for her. And we said that you plant that seed and then there's fruit. And it's totally different than the seed, but it's still a part of the seed. And so are we in our glorified bodies. Mine was glorified now. You guys got to wait, right? <laughs> For the resurrection. That's when the fullness of our redemption will happen. That's a theology of a funeral. We take somebody into the church and we sing with them. The body's in the church. We sing songs of praise, we accompany them with singing to the heads of the great mystery. And then we plant them. Right? You hear people say, well, we planted, that's where all the beers are planted. Like, we don't know the beers for a long, that's what they say. They're planted. And they know that that's theologically correct because you're planting that seed that is going to raise up to be something much better. Right, choir? So we were, look, we we're looking for that time. We don't need to fear death. Because there's a resurrection coming, there's a restored earth coming. Death. As Paul says, where's your victory? Death, where is your sin? He said, what about the cremated bodies? What about people lost at sea? What about people eaten by a wild beast? God can make way out of no way. God can make a way out of no way. And so we are the church. Fear not, my brothers and sisters. You have been redeemed. You have been saved. So we come to this table to remember that. This is my body. It's not our Toyota. Thank God it's not our Ford. This is the imperishable Christ. 
This is my body, broken for you. Christ became one of us so that we could be like Christ, clothed in Christ. This is what we did to Ethan today. We clothed him in Christ's victory. We're going to nurture him along the way. And Aubrey along the way. Be present with each other. He thanks to the Father. He broke the bread and he said, This is my body broken for you. As often as you gather together, do this in remembrance of me. Actively participate. Actively participate in the banquet. Supper was over. He took the cup. He poured out the wine. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant. For the forgiveness of your sins. The forgiveness of the sins of the world. As often as you gather together, remember this. Actively participate in it. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. What will happen on that resurrection day? We will be like Christ. Heaven and earth will be reunited. After Christ rose from the dead, we'll go out there and have a baptism. After Christ rose from the dead, he walked, he talked, he ate, he drank with people. But his body was different. He bore the scars. But they were healed. But also he could appear and disappear. Not a subject of time and space. And that's a perfecter of our faith. He says, you will be like me. When that day comes. Resurrection is not a gradual thing. It's boom. The resurrection of the body. Full redemption. As often as you gather together, do this in remembrance of me. Please pray with me. Father, I ask your Holy Spirit be on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them for us the body and blood of Christ so that we can go into the world and be the body of Christ. We ask you just to be with these families, dear Lord, as they exit this uh, sanctuary, that they remember their baptism as they get soaked with your rain. But that rain brings on bounty. That rain brings on new growth, and that rain brings on transformation. Amen. This is an open baptism. You'll follow the uh, instruction of the ushers, and come to the altar.